Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live with James Jacob Prash via Skype. Jacob, we're starting a series, glad you asked. Here's the first question from Katrina. She asks, hello, can you please tell me what does it mean, the word gospel, to the original hearers in the days of Christ? And my reference is Matthew 24, verse 14. Looking forward to your answer. Thank you so much for your question, Katrina. To understand what it meant in the days of Christ, let's understand what it meant to the ancient Hebrews generally, going back to the Old Testament. We're introduced to the term, certainly, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. If you look with me, please, to Isaiah, chapter 40, we have the introduction to the four servant songs of Isaiah the introduction to the four servant songs. The final and climactic servant song is Isaiah 52 and 53, an Old Testament prophetic description and prediction of the crucifixion and glorification of Jesus. But it begins, comfort, O comfort my people, speak kindly to Jerusalem, etc., call out to her. Well, how do we do that? Well, we do it when we get to verse 9 of Isaiah 40, get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Say to the cities of Judah in Hebrew, Hine Eloheinu, behold your God. Good news appears twice. The Hebrew word there is besora, besora. To preach the gospel is levaser, levaser. But the Hebrew term originally for gospel is bisora, and it simply means good news, but it is translated in the New Testament when it's referred to by the angelic uh, host singing the choruses, sometimes as glad tidings and peace of men to men of goodwill. Glad tidings, good news, Call it what you will. But it's introduced in Isaiah 40. Continuing through the servant songs, that verse is again repeated in Isaiah chapter 52. Verse 7, how lovely on the mountains of the feet of him who brings bisara, good news, who announces peace. Okay, who announces peace. Now we have to understand shalom as well, something we've explained many times. Why is the gospel associated with peace? Here it's the gospel of peace. The Greek word for peace in the Septuagint and in the New Testament is mainly uh, Irene. We get the girl's name, Irene, Irene. But in Hebrew, it is of course shalom, shalom, which comes from the Hebrew infinitive Le shalem, which means to pay, to fill, or fulfill. To pay, to fill, fulfill. We have peace with God because of the good news. The Messiah came to pay the price for our sin, to fulfill the law, that is the Torah, the law of Moses, and to fill us with his spirit. While the word Irene means an absence of conflict. Rather sardonically, in Great Britain, Dr. Samuel Johnson in his dictionary defined peace as a period of preparation and deception between two wars. Isaiah, however, tells us that ultimately God's shalom will include an absence of conflict. It will include that. The nations will beat their swords into plowing shears. Uh, and, 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 and the pruning oaks, and they will study war no more. This is commemorated both in Hebrew worship music and in Afro-American worship music. In the Afro-American worship music, it's down by the riverside. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. 
In Hebrew, this idea of peace that will come from gospel, from the good news, is sung a little bit differently. Lo isa goy le goy hered, lo yilmadu od milhama. Lo isa goy le goy hered, lo yilmadu od milhama. Now this does not mean the gospel is going to bring us peace now, before the return of Christ. Jesus said he came to bring a sword. People will die for the sake and the cause of the gospel. It's the gospel of peace for us because the Messiah came to pay, leshalem, to fill and to fulfill. He fulfilled the law on our behalf that no man or no Jew could keep. He paid the price for our sins and he filled us with his spirit. We can be in the biggest conflict of our lives and experience his shalom by his spirit because of the gospel of peace. Those who are born again by his spirit can have his peace irrespective of the external circumstances. We have peace through God, through Jesus' his son. However, ultimately, finally, eschatologically, if you will, shalom will include Irin. Nations will not learn war anymore. They will beat their swords into pruning hooks, their spears into plowshares. This will actually be fulfilled. Okay. Now that's the Old Testament background and the way a Jew would have thought of it. They would have related it to the four servant songs of Isaiah. Introduced in the literary prologue to the songs and Isaiah 40, but by the time we get to chapter 52 and 53, we see what it is. There's no chapter divisions, of course, in the original canon. Behold, my servant will prosper. He'll be high and lifted up, greatly exalted, in verse 13. Okay. Get up on a high mountain, bearer of good news. And then it goes on to say, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Also quoted, in Ephesians. Well, that was the background. The term that you cite, however, in Matthew 24, is not the gospel of peace. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's all the same gospel, but there are different aspects to it. Isaiah and Paul emphasize the gospel of peace. Elsewhere, Paul personalized it in relation to his own ministry as my gospel. Okay. We also read in the book of Revelation the everlasting gospel. It'll have eternal ramifications. But we also have the gospel of the kingdom from the Olivet Discourse that you point out. What is the gospel of the kingdom and what did Jesus mean? How did that apply to his own time? John the Baptist preached the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. Of the three synoptic gospels and John, Matthew is the gospel of the kingdom, where it has the kingship and the kingdom theme the most often. The gospel of the kingdom is where we use prophecy about the return of Jesus or about the coming of the Lord as an evangelistic instrument to see people get saved. Late Great Planet Earth was a very primordial book, doctrinally. But many people were saved through that book in the 1970s. Why? It preached the gospel of the kingdom. It used prophecy about the coming of the Lord as a way to introduce people to the need for salvation. The late Barry Smith, an evangelist and missionary from the South Pacific. He was actually from New Zealand originally. He uh, preached the gospel of the kingdom. He saw many, many people saved in the South Pacific, particularly also Australia and other countries, but particularly the South Pacific through preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Frankly, his teachings sometimes could not be called particularly of a high academic or theological standard, but he used end-time prophecy 
to communicate the need for salvation. He scared people into the kingdom. Uh, a book that I don't agree with, and I think it has many things about it that are erroneous, but it's still, they still communicate the gospel and use end time prophecy about the return of Christ to do it, was the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. Many non-believers read those books. It was the only book at the time other than the scriptures that outsold Rick Warren's deceptive book, um, on, oh, Purpose so, Driven Life. Yeah. The Purpose Driven Life was the only one who outsold Rick Warren. Uh, why? Well, again, Tim LaHaye used the gospel of the kingdom to communicate the gospel. Now, I knew Barry Smith. I knew Tim LaHaye. They were very effective as evangelists, not as theologians or as Bible expositors, but as evangelists. They were very effective because they did what Jesus said. In a post-Christian neo-pagan Western world, where there's very little interest anymore in the things of the Lord in most places, how do we communicate the gospel to people who don't want to hear it? Well, Jesus told us, preach the gospel of the kingdom. Use prophetic events. Look, you see Jerusalem, you see Israel. Look what it says in Zechariah 12. Jerusalem will be the stumbling block. Look what Jesus said. In Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is complete. Look at Matthew 23, the Jews had to be in Jerusalem for him to return. Look at Daniel, the countries that were in the Roman Empire have to try to stick together like iron and clay, but it doesn't work. Look at the EU, these things are happening. After being scattered for 2,000 years nearly, the Jews are back, just like Jesus said. Well, because these things are true, Satan has raised up people within the church to deny they're true. He has, you know, a hyper-preterist like Rick Godwin, who's an anti-Israel preacher in America. He has people like Stephen Sizer in Great Britain, replacement theology people who are teaching error. And yet they claim to be evangelical. Or he has Rick Warren telling people, to avoid end time prophecy altogether, even though Jesus said to be alert. Uh, because Satan knows if you preach the gospel of the kingdom, it can work at a time when people are generally apathetic. People, however, do want to know the future. They're going to astrology and fortune tellers and the occult, all sorts of things. Well, we know the future. We know the future. And we can use the gospel of the kingdom, as Jesus instructed, to communicate the message of salvation to the unsaved. So this is how gospel would have been understood. Now, I told you the Hebrew word, bisora. In Greek, in the Septuagint and in the New Testament, the word is evangelion. Evangelion, where we get the word evangelical. Evangelion. But its basic meaning is glad tidings. And the Jews of Jesus' day would have associated it with Isaiah, leading up to Isaiah 52 and 53, which you can read as a prophetic description of the crucifixion of Jesus and his exaltation. The specific reference to gospel that you make from Matthew 24 has to do with the last days. The gospel we should be preaching now is the gospel of the kingdom. I trust this answers your question, perhaps not completely, but certainly concisely and accurately. Thank you so much for your question, Katrina. God bless and tell somebody about Jesus. Thank you, Jacob.